coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. Another poll shows that the governor's race is a toss-up. And not long after that latest poll is released, Doug Ducey finally is endorsed by his GOP primary opponents. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal, and Leah Rao of the Arizona Republic. Early polling seems to suggest that Doug Ducey and Fred Duval are neck and neck in the governor's race. It, it's really a toss-up right now, isn't it? Uh, well, according to two independent polls that have come out, and you know, we've had the dearth of polling through uh, most of this election cycle, but uh, first, right before the primary, a, a poll came out from Public Policy Partners that showed them tied. And then over the weekend, in a poll conducted post-primary election, found a 40-40 tie between Ducey and Duval, um, done by um, the Rasmussen Polling group. And you mentioned public policy. That kind of leans a little bit left, yes. whereas Rasmussen kind of leads maybe a little bit right. It sounds to me like all bases are covered. This is going to be a tight race. Well, I think that's one of the reasons that people paid attention to those. Now, the, the Ducey camp and the state Republican Party dispute that Rasmussen leans right, and they've got some problems with the methodology. You know, that said, um, that, that is generally how the poll is seen as leaning a little bit towards favoring Republicans. What do you make of all this? Yeah, Rasmussen does have a Republican reputation, you know, in, in the past. The Ducey camp, like Mary Jo said, you know, said they had too many young voters in there, or too, maybe too many independents. But just like during the primary, the, those, everybody cast doubt on those pro-Ducey polls. Well, they kind of turned out to be correct. And nobody came out with other polls. So if, if, if you want to dispute a poll, then show us some other numbers. Uh, you know, Rasmussen is a pretty legitimate firm. Even public policy, which is Democratic leaning, has had, you know, legitimate uh, polling. So, you know, both of them show the same thing. I think they're both kind of starting off, you know, kind of tied. Obviously, there's a lot of inherent advantages to being the Republican and being Ducey uh, in this race versus, versus Duval. But, but right now, it shows tied and a lot of, a lot of undecided voters. But it's early. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you've still got, you know, weeks. I mean, it's, you know, somebody's to win. I think, you know, we're going to see this is the first of many, the second of many polls. And, you know, I think everybody will they'll go back and forth in terms of his up and down. As far as name recognition, this, this latest poll, Ducey had pretty strong recognition. Uh, Duval, not quite as much. That's to be expected, I would imagine, after a pretty bruising primary. Definitely. I mean, you know, Duval didn't have any primary opponents. He tried to kind of stick his head in it every now and then. He, d he did some of the forums, um, but no, when you've got a primary like that, as nasty as that one was, it's everybody was talking about Ducey in that race. I think that's going to be an advantage, just a head start for Ducey. He has, he has ads out there. He, everybody knows him from Cold Stone, he's state treasurer, and you know he got a lot of free publicity, obviously, from the primary. Fred Duvall does not have a lot of name ID. You know, he's a consultant. He was a Clinton White House aide, energy, you know, worked for T-Bone Pickens, uh, chair of the Board of Regents. But your average folks don't really know that. Everybody knows Cold Stone. So, but the poll is good news for, for a Democrat. He's not down 15 points. He's not down 10 points. He's in the race. So, so that gives Democrats a little bit of optimism. And I, and I wonder if that's partially some fatigue from the primary. I mean, Ducey got, he won that primary big with 37% of the vote. But, you know, 63% of the vote went elsewhere. And um, you know, perhaps some of those voters looked at Duval as as an alternative. Plus, you've got Democrats, you know, weighing in on this one, and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna pull for the guy for their party. So, um, you know, they're off to the races, and yeah. Duval's got a, a name ID to get well established. Well, the last time a Democrat weeks. won, Janet Napolitano. There was fatigue with Republicans. There was fatigue with what was going on at the legislature, fatigue with Republicans being in power, and I think that'll be kind of key to, to Duval having a chance. Any surprise, uh, this latest poll, Ducey stronger on fiscal issues, Duval stronger on social issues, uh, kind of be, to be expected, I would think. With the parties, I mean, that kind yeah. of goes along party lines. I think, you know, we'll see what happens again when we, they start to debate. I think they've got a forum on Wednesday next week. That's kind of the first one, so mm -hmm. that'll... That'll be brings maybe yes. some new issues in there. I think it's an economic policy one. We'll see what that does for Duval or helps Ducey. Uh, the, the first one, uh, the one that maybe leans left if you want to go that way, <laughs> um, that included Barry Hess, the libertarian, and that had Hess at 12 percent, which had a lot of <laughs> eyebrows raising. First of all, uh, are we buying that? And secondly, uh, that's got to cut into, I would think, 
reduce these numbers. Yeah, I, I don't know. I buy 12%. I mean, I don't know. Maybe the last time a libertarian posted numbers like that in reality in Arizona might have been when John Buttrick ran for yeah, governor years right, ago. Yeah. Um, you know, but that again might be sort of the, you know, none of the above kind of vote being reflected in the support for Hess. And the Rasmussen poll, we should mention, did not mention Hess, the Libertarian, or anyone other than Ducey or Duval. It still finished tied. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's folks on the right, conservative folks, that are frustrated with, with both parties. They're not going to vote for Democrats, so they're looking, they kind of side with Libertarians, kind of the Ron Paul, Rand Paul type crowd. If it's a really tight race in the end, then maybe maybe uh, Hess has yeah. a, is a deciding factor. But it would take a lot, and that's a pretty high number. And then days after this, this latest uh, dead heat poll, uh, here comes Ken Bennett endorsing, and not too long thereafter, here comes uh, Jones, and here comes Smith. Everyone now on board as far as Republicans. Technically, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but those endorsements were a little chilly, particularly coming from Smith and Jones. I mean, you know, they released their endorsement via Facebook, Ducey responded via Twitter. It's sort of like divorced parents getting together for the sake of the kids. I mean, <laughs> you know, they kind of said, we'll do it, you know, we support the conservative, we support the Republican, but it was not a friendly endorsement. Was there any threat that they weren't going to endorse? I think there was some legitimate concern that they may not endorse at all. I'm not sure how realistic some of the folks say, you know, oh, well, they'll go with Duval. I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah. But I think there was some legitimate concern that they would just stay out of it altogether. And as far as the endorsements themselves, if, if you're Doug Ducey and you're running for governor, uh, the folks that went with Scott Smith, are, are, is, is his endorsement going to help you all that much? I don't think so. I mean, you're, it's expected. It's a story if, if he endorses a Democrat. It's a story if he doesn't endorse at all. You could see some kind of independent-leaning Smith supporters, independents and moderate Republicans that might vote for, for Duval because of social issues or just frustration with, with kind of the, the legislature and some of the shenanigans they're up to. So it, it, does, Matt, it does help do see that Smith endorsed, but I don't think your individual voters are going to really be swayed too much by this. It's more of yeah. a media story. Yeah, and, and, to, and maybe to a lesser, a much lesser extent, it, it, the, the intent is to show unity among the Republicans. And, you know, you're not going to have outliers, you know, sitting there, you know, chinking rocks at the, you know, at, at their nominee. So they want to show unity. That that certainly is very helpful. It, it, they, they will show, obviously, it does show unity. The governor was there on, on election night yeah. uh, showing unity. Quickly. And yet this is a guy that Sounds like he wants to dismantle her legacy operation there. With the, I, I couldn't figure that out. Again, yeah. um, voters, when they see, they were, let's say you were strongly for Christine Jones, strongly for Scott Smith. Now they're saying, go Ducey. Are they go Ducey? I think um, the governor is. I mean, she, you know, she didn't, she didn't intend, I don't think, to divide the party with her endorsement. She wanted to support her legacy, you know, kind of encourage that. But there was never any any thought that she would not endorse whoever the winner was. You know, she's she's also all about the party and wants to kind of unite the party. So we saw that. I mean, literally, like you said, on election night, she was right there next to him, patting him on the back, supporting him, cheering for him. And, and I think we'll see that throughout the rest of the campaign. There is a big block of, of voters in the middle don't usually vote in the primaries, sometimes younger, that are frustrated with the image of the state, the things that the legislature passes in terms of SB 1070 and 1062 and all the gun bills, that, that, that Duval has a chance to, to grab that they might usually vote Republican, but they're frustrated they want a stopgap against those types of bills. And I think that's going to be the challenge for both candidates. Can Ducey hold on to those with that inherent advantage in registration? Mm -hmm. or, or can Fred turn out new voters and kind of grab some of those folks in the middle that might have supported Smith? Right. And to sort of make that point, I mean, Duval came out this week with you know uh, Republicans for Fred. I think he's using Fred a lot in his campaign literature and announcements to show you know his broad support that his support goes beyond just one party. A lot of these are Republicans who, at a quick glance, you know they they, they backed Napolitano when mm -hmm. she when she was governor. So there weren't any. You didn't see Christine Jones on that list. You, know, you didn't see <laughs> Scott Smith on that list, which would have really caught people's eyes. But the idea is to show that he has broad support. And, and I'm, I'm waiting for a Democrats for Ducey list. Um, <laughs> well, well. I think that's the question is, I think everybody's watching to see how does Ducey pull back to the center. He ran a very conservative primary race. Now he's got to come back and try to get some of those independents, some of those more moderates. and. Kind of where does he go from here after his current well, stance? And that's a good point. I mean, how far does he go with Medicaid, his questions yeah. and concerns regarding Medicaid expense? Yeah. Does he sit out there and start yelling about this again, or does he pipe down about it? That's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it was such a key issue during the primary. I, you can't, 
go the other direction, but maybe there's less of a conversation. I think we're going to see more conversations on economic development, on yeah. businesses. How do we bring businesses? How do we improve jobs? Maybe some on education, but I'm guessing that his big focus is going to be economic development, and he stays away from some of the more social issues. Yeah, yeah Medicaid's been a difficult one for. He doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, it had to be dragged out of him like last fall by a by a group of reporters that you know sort of ambushed him or assaulted him to get his position on that. And it just it doesn't do him any good to to bring that up now. Certainly, we'll probably see. Fred Duval <laughs> raising that issue, yes. and I th and I think there's a role for the media to make sure that we understand where this you know uh, would be governor. What's he going to do with this this very important policy that was really hard fought, and it's still in the courts. Still in the courts. In fact, um, just this week the Supreme Court set a date. Um, they're going to hear. Governor Brewer's challenge to this, she wants the court to just end this whole dispute that lawmakers even have standing to, to bring a, a challenge to Medicaid. Uh, and interestingly, that um, hearing is going to be two days after the general election. Wow. So it will All be very right. interesting to see who comes, who shows up in the court. Will the governor elect? Be there. And what, dif what decisions the governor-elect might even have to make once the court is all said and done. All right, let's move on. Uh, Andy Tobin wins. Keeney concedes. Wow. Just that barely. Was, that's a, was, what do you have here? 407 votes? Yeah, Is that what we just got? Just barely. A lot closer than folks, I think, would have thought at the beginning of this. It certainly probably uh, buoys the confidence of Ann Kirkpatrick in the general. And we'll see if Republicans invest their money in this race nationally. Is this going to be a target race? Or are they going to move to some of these other Arizona mm -hmm. races where they, they do have some chances, too? But yeah, it was a very tight uh, primary in a mostly rural district. And Tobin was supposedly had good name ID, had national backing, had a lot of backing from the establishment. And it was ended up being a lot closer than people thought. And Keeney said he would immediately uh, pledge to support Tobin, which, you know what, that's going to help Tobin. I mean, apparently Keeney was a stronger candidate than most folks thought. Definitely. That was a big surprise race. And yeah, I think, you know, we'll definitely see some unity in that race. Those two can come together. They've got some similar issues. And you know, it's going to be a, a tough fight against Kirkpatrick, and they'll come together for talk, that. Talk about that district, because, again, it, it leans a touch Democrat, but voted for Romney in the last presidential election. That really is a toss-up area. It is, and if you remember, um, it, the, the lines were different, but, you know, Ann Kirkpatrick was elected from that uh, that sprawling district in 2008, lost the seat in 2010, then came back in 12. So it, it sort of bounces around. The, you know, the, before that, the district had um, elected Rick Renzi, and he enjoyed, I think, a couple of terms before mm -hmm. he got into trouble and, and had to leave. Um, so it's, yeah, it is largely rural, um, but it does lean Democrat, but it tends to be that brand of Democrats that you know, are conservative and um, don't have trouble casting Republican ballots. But they got, but they got to be wooed. And, yes. Um, and it also includes the Navajo Reservation, and the Navajo Reservation has a presidential election coming up mm, on November 4th. Uh-oh. So um, now Tobin's Impact. been up there. He's worked the reservation, um, and certainly Kirkpatrick's been all over it as well. So I think she sees that as sort of the ace in her hole as many Democrats. Yeah, that was a deciding factor last time when, when she won was the Navajo turnout. And it's interesting to see what issue kind of drives things up there. You saw it kind of early in the cycle. Republicans were talking about Obamacare a lot and really tying her votes to that on that. And, and I think that issue's maybe died down a, a little bit. Immigration certainly an issue, obviously national security. And that that district is certainly, you know, leans Democrat, but it's kind of conservative. But is it really hardcore in an immigration district like you might see down in, down in uh, Barber's district? So it'd be interesting to see if Republicans, you know, put a lot of chips on him or if they move him elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's the outside money especially. Yeah, and even though, you know, the primary perhaps was underwhelming and Tobin's performance was underwhelming, I think, you know, the reset button gets pushed yeah. once you're with a general, there's going to be there's going to be support coming in from the Republican National Congressional Committee and and other donors. That, you know, they want that seat, and I haven't seen indications that they've given up on that at, at this point. Have you seen the, the Kirsten Cinema ad with the parents of the PTSD soldier that committed suicide? Yes, I have. What were your first thoughts? Um, it's a great ad. It's compelling. Um, it's, I understand the, the criticism of it from Rogers and the Republicans. She's politicizing the suicide of, 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 of a military, or got in the army, and who went to the VA, didn't get service.
regardless. And her, his parents are, are in the ad with her. But it's so personal and so compelling. Anybody that knows journalism, anytime you can personalize a story, it mm. makes it so much better. She talks to his parents about it. They support her. He, she, he, she, has, she has siblings that are in the military. And she makes it so serious see, that it's just about her and it, it matters to her that I think the, the, the cost or the negatives of politicizing something are outweighed by the fact that this is such a compelling ad and shows her that shows people that she not only cares about this issue, but it's personal to her. Uh, Ali, have you seen the ad? I have. Okay, it, Wendy Rogers' campaign says it's sickening, revolting, and in poor taste. Uh, what do you make of all this? It's, you know, it, it's a compelling ad. You know, it, it, it tells a story. You know, I, I wonder if it's a little bit of a story that Rogers may have wanted to t tell herself, maybe not in that way. Right. Um, you know, I do understand she's got some serious concerns about it. You know, you're publicizing a family that went through a heartbreaking situation. <laughs> And how do you do that? But Wendy Rogers is a military vet herself, and this is a key issue for her. It's going to be interesting in that race how these two kind of clash on that issue. I mean, Sinema dealt with that issue in the legislature. It was a big issue for her. Mm. Um, some of the veteran legislation, it's something that she's, you know, kind of tried to be involved in in Congress. So it'll be interesting to see how that issue plays in this race. I think one thing that sort of blunts some of the criticism is the fact that the parents are cooperating, cooperating with this. I mean, they're they're thanking their congresswoman, and they apparently she wouldn't be doing this if you know she didn't have uh, the consent of the family to talk about um, uh, about the soldier. So, when, when, so she says, you know, these could have been my brothers, or older brother and younger brother that are serving, um, and you're talking again about a family that suffers this kind of a loss. No questions. I think there's a legitimate criticism yeah. of it. You're politicizing this issue, but but this is politics, and this mm -hmm. is an ad that really casts Kirsten in, in a, a very positive light. It shows something you don't think about politicians nowadays that that they have empathy for every every everyday people for for somebody that goes through these things, and it shows a really human face in political ads that often don't do that. Except yes. it. It did give the Republicans a chance when the ad first came out to, to remind everybody that cinema, you know, for a brief moment, fundraised yeah. off of the VA scandal when it first broke. She put, it, she had a fundraising appeal. She pulled it back and apologized, but it went out, and they're going to make sure that we remember that that bell was rung. There were a lot of questions surrounding that that response from her, the email, the fundraiser. I think that drew a lot of criticism. Maybe this is a little bit of a response to that, kind of showing yeah. a little bit more sensitive side. First ad out of the gate. But, yeah, <laughs> r reporters had a lot of questions about yeah. fundraising. And all it right. doesn't show her as a Democrat at all. It shows her as somebody that supports supports veterans and any anybody that thinks that this is a partisan issue. Um, mm. She's on the side of veterans, which is usually something Republicans like, uh, try to try to grab onto. Okay, interesting. All right, we got uh, some schools chiefs, ex-schools chiefs, uh, Jaime Malera, Lisa Graham Keegan, both Republicans, both coming out and and uh, taking a couple of veiled shots at the Republican candidate for superintendent of public instruction. Surprised? Um, n no, um, this was uh, 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 former school superintendents, Jaime Malera and Lisa Graham Keegan um, and Carolyn Warner, yes. um, saying that they back, uh, that, that they back David Garcia and sort of blasting Diane Douglas, who is the Republican nominee. Um, I say it's not surprising because Keegan, during Hoopenthal's meltdown over the anonymous blog post, um, said, oh my goodness, you know, if he loses, the seat goes to a Democrat. Well, she's helping that happen. <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't too surprised. And, and again, Jaime Miller said that Arizona does not need a, extreme nonsensical views. Mm. That's pretty rough stuff. Well, Jaime's a pretty moderate Republican. You know, he's he's been kind of out of the primary field for a while on the Republican side. He's a business type uh, Republican. Um, it comes down to Common Core a lot. You know, Diane ran against Common Core. That's a, that's a big issue on the right. And it's also a big issue for, for businesses and, and, and moderates who want to see it go through. Um, Democrats have a chance in this race. We'll see what kind of general election campaign Douglas runs. If she runs, has a lot of errors, if stuff comes out when she has some very nonsensical extreme views, um, then she could be in trouble. If she doesn't, she probably has some advantages because she's a Republican. Lisa Graham Keegan says she wants someone with, quote, integrity uh, that uses honest data in coming to conclusions. I mean, they're, they're all but saying, uh, you know, they're just all but dismissing the Republican candidate here. Well, no, I think, you know, a lot of political folks are. This is, this is a candidate that sort of came out of nowhere. You know, I think a lot of people don't know much about her. Other than Common Core, I'm not sure people heard much about what her issues are, what she stands for, what she's going to do. Uh, there's some general concern about that. We need to see what she's going to do, you know, for the next few, next month or so, but 
And, and Graham Keegan um, is from Peoria, and Diane Douglas was on the Peoria School Board, and oh, yeah, that's and right. during that time, the school, I believe the school's um, rating, uh, its letter grade um, went down mm -hmm. a tick. Um, Diane Douglas was on the board at the time that that happened, and Lisa Graham is happy to point that out to people. We should, uh, we should also mention that Diane Douglas responded by saying it was no surprise that they support greater federal interference and that they are educational insiders. Does that kind of, first of all, do you not, I would think you would kind of want an educational insider in that <laughs> particular office. It's where, who makes the decisions? Is it coming from Washington, i.e. the White yeah. House and but, the unpopular but, president? Or is, or is it parents is parents and, you know, local schools deciding that? That'll be the argument. Yeah. I think the challenge here for, for Garcia and the Democrats is to raise the profile of this race. If this is a down ticket race and doesn't, doesn't, is a blip on the screen, Douglas will probably win. People vote Republican. She's Republican. She may get some advantages because she's a woman. Um, but if this is raised up, if she makes some mistakes, if we find out some of her views are kind of out there or nonsensical, and they can make this a high-profile race, then I think he has a chance. I, I, but again the, again, the Common Core issue, John Hoopenthal, uh, you know, he said that that was 100% the reason, and we all know that that's not 100% the reason why he lost the primary. However, how much, I mean, we know Diane Douglas's position on Common Core. She's made it very clear, but we don't know much about anything else. School funding, infrastructure, online, the getting to rural school. Graduation rates, yeah, a lot of other issues. No, but I mean, that is what a campaign is for, is to try to bring out, you know, candidates' positions on those issues. And um, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's a few debates scheduled and um, there is media coverage of it. So um, hopefully we'll get a more robust picture, both of her and of David Garcia. Yes, yes, exactly. And we're supposed to have one right here too. So we're looking Dude, forward, <laughs> looking forward to that. Um, before we go, Tesla uh, says adios to Arizona. Welcome Nevada with, with, and thanks for the billion dollars of help you're going to yeah. give us as well. Yeah, they're locating this, this big battery plants, $5 billion, 6,500 jobs. Um, wave of the future stuff. Um, big competition between Arizona, Nevada, California, Texas, New Mexico. Uh, Reno, where it landed, was kind of the favorite all along. Nevada gave them a lot of incentives, a lot of upfront stuff, uh, uh, utility costs, sales taxes, all kinds of taxes. The fact that, that Arizona killed that bill in the legislature that would have let them sell cars here directly certainly did, that hurt. Um, but I don't think we could keep up with the upfront stuff that Nevada, Nevada was giving. Well, they killed that bill, but we also got the bill <laughs> where, you know, getting electricity for free for manufacturers in the state. That's, wasn't that designed expressly for Tesla? It would have benefited him for sure. I'm not sure. There was some talk about whether it would have helped Apple as well yeah. when they were coming in. So, yeah, we sort of, in one side, we helped them. On the other side, we hindered them. But I think, you know, right, the upfront stuff is, was the conversation about how much money can you give them upfront as incentives. And I'm not sure Arizona was willing to do much and, of that. And just to be clear, it's not giving them electricity for free. It's just waiving the, the tax, sales the tax, tax yes, on it. The sales tax, Which, yes. you know, which is another tax break that the, our Arizona legislature gave in hopes of getting this. We didn't get the Tesla, but the tax break stays for manufacturing businesses. And not only that, some of the folks wanted a special session at the last minute to add incentives to what were already there. Oh, you, you talk to every other lawmaker wants a special session for <laughs> something or another. You know, it's, oh, it's the most important issue in the world. What's interesting is it was um, one of the proponents of that was Representative Ethan Orr, who I guess in hindsight then said, well, maybe it was just as well that we didn't do that because who knows what they would yeah. have given, been tempted to give away for for no gain. Well, the sweepstakes for these things, these, these big corporate projects, are, are a little out of control. Texas has is, is got big incentives. Nevada's package is, is just way beyond what anybody else was giving. And plus, you have foreign competition. You got the Asian countries willing to build plants and basically give them to corporations. Now, if this thing turns out and Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, starts selling electric batteries to everybody, the US military, it's going to be a great thing for Nevada. But there's also a risk when, when it's not performance based, when you're given upfront incentives before they've created jobs before a business model has worked. There's a big risk there. The super collider of several decades ago never, <laughs> oh really, goodness, never yes. really came to fruition. They wanted free electricity too. Yes, but they yeah, did, yeah. Yes. Uh, but, So are we going to see uh, more of these incentive-laden uh, come-hither kind of bills? or Because uh, I know the, there's a lot of folks in the legislature saying it's not worth it, it's not fair to everyone who's already here, or the little mom and pops that don't get anywhere near these kinds of benefits. I don't know if we're going to have much choice. I mean, you have an education funding lawsuit that could, you know, do some serious damage to the budget. We've got a ton of incentives already. They may have to start looking at which ones they need to eliminate just to pay their bills. That's true. Um, but this isn't a new thing either. I mean, this is something we've seen for 
for decades in various forms. But yeah, in the short term, I'm not sure that we're financially able to do some of the stuff. Yeah, I think a lot of that will depend on who's the next governor and how he, because it's going to be a he, how he is you know, predisposed towards the idea of picking winners and losers or the level playing field. Um, but um, Senate leadership is not on board with this idea, yeah. and I think the way House leadership looks like it might be shaping up, they're not going to go for this. All right. Good conversation. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear the other side of the Prop 480 debate for a new and expanded county hospital system, and we'll learn about a nonprofit organization bringing families together to help the community. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.